Well, good morning. Good morning. Good, morning. good to see you all here in the house of the Lord. Uh, with Goldcrest and uh, Eric, uh, uh, between them there's, there's some illness there, nothing to panic about. But, uh, so that's why we'll miss these at the Goldcrest uh, team this morning. So just if you're wondering why the program was skipped, that's it. So uh, again, it's good to see you all here today. What a, isn't it nice? I mean, look, Thanksgiving coming, but I love the harvest songs. And thanks to them, and band played that we plow the fields and scatter. And uh, I grew up on harvest. I clearly in England didn't grow up on Thanksgiving uh, because we didn't celebrate that. But it's all linked together. I came over here, and, and uh, but I love harvest. I love the harvest songs, and uh, but we love Thanksgiving, don't we? So uh, you get into Thanksgiving this week. Enjoy your time, and uh, uh, we'll be missing our families, I think, in many uh, situations. Thank uh, the Lord for FaceTime and all these things where you can actually not feel as though you're that distant. So, uh, and if you're having family, whatever, you, please be careful. Folks at home, it's good to have you with us this morning. I trust you really feel that you are worshipping with us as we uh, spend these times on these Sunday mornings. But this is just a message. It's it's somewhat uh, sobering, I think, to watch the news on uh, COVID and what have you. Don't, don't you just wish it would go away? <laughs> but it's not. And I fear Thanksgiving, Christmas, I think it's going to be the new year before we kind of settle down. And so be very careful and be wise and smart. Uh, we are good salvationists. So the building's open. We're going to be there. No, no, no. no. And so just be, be wise and, uh, and be careful and be, uh, look out for each other. The phone is there. Give, it, give everyone a call. But, uh, and who remembers uh, when they were 18? Because we have, <laughs> this week, one of our young men has celebrated his 18th birthday, John Ferreira Stan. <laughs> Great. And again, you know, we just in these days it's hard to celebrate some of these things and there'd be a big party and whatever you say. Just wait till the 21st, John. Remind your parents they got away with it on the 18th, you know. <laughs> I don't know. Dis Disney or somewhere. Make them uh, make them enjoy the 21st. But it's just wonderful. Happy birthday. And good to have and it's good to have John coming so regularly and playing in the ensemble. He's a fine young man. As are all our folk who come. And join with us in this way. This week, uh, up to Thanksgiving, tomorrow evening, we have our Zoom Fellowship Hour. So I'll send the invite out this afternoon. And if you've not tried it, give it a whirl. Tomorrow evening, our guests are international guests. And so we have Colonels Wayne and Cheryl Maynard, who are the territorial commanders in Japan. And so it's going to be 8 o'clock Tuesday morning, their time, but they're going to come on and join with us tomorrow evening. So that's at uh, 7 o'clock. So we'll get the flavor of, J of Japan. And we've heard all these, you know, some have had the chance to go there. And we know it's an interesting and different society. They'll tell us about the Salvation Army in Japan as well, which is quite vibrant. And so, and then, of course, uh, we'll be... They'll be moving in April, in April, if you've not caught up with the news, they are going to be the new training principals in the International College for Officers in London. And so uh, that will be a change for them, but we're, we're going to catch them in Japan and uh, find out what's happening there and how COVID is on, on all of that. So tomorrow evening, that's on Zoom. And then Tuesday evening, we will have our Bible study. And uh, Wednesday, Corkadex is on. And uh, then Thursday, we'll take this week off on Thursday from our Sunday school class. Uh, Thanksgiving, enjoy your turkey at home. And uh, Christmas is here. Christmas is rolling. <laughs> yes. Um, the kettles are out. Cynthia, and um, probably all of you have already seen her, Andrews. Um, she's standing there and, uh, and so is Ginger. Yeah, it's, it's wonderful. Oh yeah, and so it's great, and we have kettles out at shores and what have you, so you'll see it building a little bit over the next few weeks. So just you're aware of that, and uh, Cynthia, she sees this as a ministry, which it is, 
It's not just raising funds. And so uh, cards are handed out and she shares with people. So if you uh, head to Landry's, look for Cynthia and break her and make her day. Um, so that's just one. Also, if you go online on, on uh, Facebook, you will see the Share the Red Kettle, uh, our logo and our advert there. So share it, if you would. I mean, make a donation, if you wish, but make it and share it. And just to clarify, all the funds that are coming from that are coming to Old Orchard Leaves. You know, that's some kind of, sometimes a challenge um, in the armed locals we so national and international territorial. But the funds from that red capital are coming right into here. So if you have friends around who say, I'd like to make that donation, there you go, just share it. One thing that we have decided is to cancel the Christmas concert, which was scheduled for December 9th. So we're not going to hold that. That is just an example of us trying to be wise, or however, to react to COVID. And, um, and we're gonna stay uh, loose, uh, what is it? Swift on our feet, just in case we have to make any other changes. So bear with us, but we're just trying to be uh, as wise as we can. So we decided not to have that uh, Christmas concert. And a lot of it is we just can't load in more musicians and what have you. So we are limited somewhat. So that's just so you know that Christmas is here. Again, if you want to help, we'll have distribution. It'll be curbside, see uh, it? Major Karen <laughs> and Major Dan for uh, cattle help, etc. And again, there's always the opportunity to make the donations. Thank you for your weekly cartridges and uh, ties that are flowing into the basket out there as you leave um, later this morning. And again, if you have a spiritual need, just stay in your seats and our core officer will come and uh, and, uh, meet with you. Our officer will meet with you. And again, for those at home, welcome to Old Orchard Beach. The sun is shining. I didn't start with it today. I'll try (laughs) to put the weather at the end. So the sun is shining. So if you're not in Maine, you're missing a lovely day. If you are in Maine, God bless you. And uh, I will now ask Major Carol Williams to come.
delighted to be standing in front of you and share again the word of God. Please join me on the bold. The Lord is our rock and our salvation. Let us proclaim our joy and thanks to you in song. The Lord is our God and our King who is above all others. The world is in his hands and all he has made is his. The Lord is our Father. And we are his people. Let us bow before him and kneel in worship to him. Let us be mindful always of God's voice. Let us welcome him into our hearts and rejoice for all he has done for us. Amen. And certainly it is our privilege to give praise to the Lord and thanks for all he has done. We're going to sing together a prayer for us. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. I don't always feel whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation. So rich, so free. is seriously ill. We want to remember in prayer Laura's mother, Major Tammy Hench, who apparently has the virus and uh, is, again, seriously ill with that. We also want to remember Katie Cocker in prayer and Marcia have asked for special prayer for this precious young woman. We continue to pray for Ron and Phyllis, for Walt and Ann and Judy and Vinny, for Lamont and Bev and Karen Green, for Karen and Blair, for Marie Hyde, for Bob and Janice, Honey Kittle and her recovery from surgery for Alberta and Rose. We would also include Eric Carvel, who's not well today. But also, my heart is just felt a little heavy these days for Jane and for Ernie, for Carl. 
thinking of going through this time having recently lost loved ones. And yet, in the midst of all this, we say give thanks. This is the time of thanksgiving. And I invite you now to join me as we approach God's throne of grace and that we give him the adoration collectively and personally to this God of all creation. Let us pray. Father, in, in these moments, we, we think about the fact that what is man that you are mindful of him? And yet you, in your majesty, in the splendor that you have created around us, in the heavens and the seas, we see so much in which we can rejoice. We think of, of your faithfulness. We think of the faithfulness and comfort that you have given to these who have been sick for so long, who continue in a very difficult physical state, and yet they often testify to your faithfulness and the comfort that is given to them. As human beings, we thank you, Father, for the strength and power that you give us in the midst of temptation. There are times when we need forgiveness, Father, because we are not as faithful as we ought to be. We thank you for your mercy, which is abundant and flows freely and brings us our salvation. And Father, as each of these names have been read this morning, we once again bring before you those of our friends and comrades who need that comfort, that strength, that mercy that comes from you. We thank you, Lord, for the blessing that has come from this place, these people, our army, for the fellowship of believers that we share together we realize that this too is a gift from you. And we thank you, Father, for the privilege of worship. And as we come before you here in this place, we thank you that your word goes forth with truth and power, that you use the ministry of majors Dan and Karen and others in this core who touch the lives of people each day. And we thank you, Father, because your presence is here this very moment in our homes as well as in this sanctuary. And you are here to bring blessing in glory to us because we honor you. And so we pray that our hearts will be flooded with thanks and praise to the God of all creation. And we ask this in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen.
cleanliness is next to godliness. <laughs> this is um, Matthew 25, verse 31. The sheep and the goats. When he finally arrives, blazing in beauty, and all his angels with him, the Son of Man will take his place on his glorious throne. Then all the nations will be arranged before him, and he will sort the people out. Much as a shepherd sorts out sheep and goats, putting sheep to the right and goats to the left. Then the king will say to those on the right, enter you who are blessed by my Father, take what's coming to you in this kingdom. It's been ready for you since the world's foundation. And here's why. I was thirsty, and you fed me. I, I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was homeless, and you gave me a room. I was shivering, and you gave me clothes. I was sick, and you stopped. To visit. I was in prison and you came to me. Then those sheep are going to say, Master, what are you talking about? When did we see, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you, thirsty and give you a drink? And when did we ever see you sick or in prison and come to you? Then the king will say, I'm telling the solemn truth. Whenever you did one of these things to someone overlooked or ignored, that was me. You did it to me. Then he will turn to the goats, the ones on his left, and say, get out. Worthless goats, you're good for nothing but the fires of hell. And why? Because I was hungry and you gave me no meal. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was homeless, and you gave me no bed. I was shivering, and you gave me no clothes, sick and in prison, and you never visited. Then those goats are going to say, Master? What are you talking about? When did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or homeless or shivering or sick or in prison and didn't help? We, he will answer them. I'm telling the solemn truth. Whenever you fail to do one of these things to someone who is being overlooked or ignored, that was me. You failed to do it to me. Then those goats will be herded to their eternal. 
eternal doom. But the seed to their eternal reward. That is one heavy duty scripture. It's just beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, Dick, you read that scripture, which just <laughs> brings it alive. Thank you so much for that, for that reading. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Father God, as we gather together, your people, your family, We give you honor and we give you glory. And we are so grateful for the many blessings that you bestow upon us. And now, Lord, let us hear your word from your heart. We are gathered together, seeking the Lord's blessing. Be with us this day. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, today is uh, Harvest Sunday, or the Sunday before Thanksgiving, um, but it's also known in the liturgical calendar as Christ the King Sunday, or the very last Sunday in the church year, for next Sunday is, believe it or not, is the first Sunday in Advent. Can you believe how quickly everything is going by? Um, th on Thursday, most of us will be at home on uh, 
some of us eating turkey, uh, gathering with our family and friends. And uh, even though for many of us, it'll be a virtual gathering in a lot of ways, um, where we might be eating turkey in front of a screen and our loved ones are eating turkey in front of a screen, but we're eating together. Uh, despite everything we've endured, though, we've heard it said, and thank you, Commissioner Todd, for your word today. Uh, we have much to be thankful for, even with the, the challenges that we face. In the last two weeks, uh, we have spoken about the eternal hope that we have in Christ and how God does not want us to be caught off guard when Christ returns. We are also called to remain vigilant, as we heard last week, because we belong to the day and not to the night. Well, today's scripture, commonly referred to as the parable of the sheep and the goats, is not really a parable. It's more of an apocalyptic revelation when Jesus describes a time when he will return and there will be a separation and a judgment. Now, as I read today's scripture in preparation for the, today's message, a song came to my memory. Uh, some of you may be familiar. It's from another Christian tradition, but I will try to do the first verse of it. Um, uh, I'll try to do a good job with the first verse of it. Um, it goes like this. Whatsoever you do, to the least of my brothers that you do unto me. When I was hungry, you gave me to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me to drink. Now enter into the home of my father. Whatsoever you do, to the least of my brothers that you do unto me. <laughs> that song was written by a Catholic priest, uh, Father Willard Javosh, his name, and uh, it might have been the first song I ever heard in the church as a young lad that called my attention to what we might call today social, social justice. Treating people kindly and helping those in need is a prominent theme of today's scripture reading. However, we'd be falling short of understanding the full intent of the message if we just thought that the scripture was about teaching people the necessity of being kind. Being kind is important, but the passage is also about how people have been receptive to Christ and his message. Today's scripture comes at the end of a very long section in Matthew where Jesus is speaking about the end times. When the Son of Man comes in glory, and I'm not going to do this reading justice compared to our brother Dick, but I'm going to try. <laughs> when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people from one another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Now, the, I don't know about you, but the imagery here to me is spectacular, this imagery. Uh, Jesus is returning not as a carpenter's son, so to speak, although he still is a carpenter's son, uh, but he says he's returning as a glorious king, sitting on a throne, all the angels with him, and all the nations gathered before him. And then every single person has to step in front of him individually, and they're separated into groups. And Jesus uses the illustration of the shepherd and the sheep and the goats, just as an illustration, but those hearing this parable would have understood that the sheep and the goats mingle throughout the day. But there comes a time in the shepherd's life that he has to separate them for whatever reason. It could be shearing, it could be milking, it could be culling, or it could be just taking in the goats for the night because the sheep could bear the cold weather better than the goats could. 
But this idea of separating sheep and goats would have been a familiar sort of image that the people would have, would have understood. Now, in Jesus' story, the sheep are placed on the right. And the right is a place of power, a place of honor. And we learn that they will be spared God's wrath and will receive an inheritance. Whereas the goats are placed on the left and they suffer a fate described as an eternal fire. Now there's a similar version of this separation and judgment in Revelation, uh, chapter 20, verses 11 to 15, where the revelator John records that Jesus is sitting on a great white throne. And the living and the dead will be judged according to what they've done. And a book will be opened called the Book of Life. And those whose names are found in the Book of Life, again, would be spared the wrath of God and receive an eternal inheritance. Whereas those whose name were not found in the book suffer a very different fate. Now, in both of these accounts, Jesus is a king. And the people are separated into these two groups with a totally different future. And again, it's the spectacular imagery we have in this apocalyptic sort of revelation, uh, which relies on visions and symbols and imagery to reveal God's ultimate triumph. Because what we're talking about here is God's ultimate triumph with righteousness being restored and established, and evil being dealt with once and for all. So what determines if someone is sent to God's right or is sent to God's left? Jesus says in verse 34 of today's scripture, then the king will say to those on the right, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. And we have a little hint here. Inheritance. Focus on that word. Inheritance. Then Jesus continues in, in the parable. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. And I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. And I was a stranger and you invited me in. And I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. The king in the story is recognizing the kind acts of those who have now been designated as the sheep and placed on his right. But the people, they get confused because they don't even remember serving any king. And this is when the king reveals that whatever they did, and my translation says, Whatever you did to the least of these brethren of mine, that you did for me. Now make no mistake, when Jesus is talking about these brethren, whenever Matthew mentions brothers or brethren, of course he means sisters too, but he's talking about the gospel message and Jesus himself. That the brothers, my brethren, are those who have accepted the gospel who've accepted Jesus as their Savior. So what he's talking about is, how have you treated the Jews and the prophets and the apostles and those who have come in my name? You see, the disciples traveled the countryside preaching the gospel, relying on the hospitality of those visitors, those villages and those people, relying on their hospitality. Who took them into their home? They were often itinerant. They just went two by two, right? They went, and they, and they were going in to preach the message of the gospel. And how were they received? The least of my brothers. Now, we'll get on to the humanitarian side of this in a minute, because there is a humanitarian aspect to this. But as the disciples traveled the countryside, they depended on the hospitality and the provision provided for them by those who would receive them. Now, we know from the exploits of Paul and others, that in some cases the apostles were received well, and in some cases they weren't received so well. Now the principle here is when you show kindness 
and accept someone's agent. You're accepting and showing kindness to the one who sent them. It's a biblical principle. When you reject someone's agent, you're rejecting the one who sent you. Jesus spoke of this principle himself in Matthew chapter 10, verses 40 and 43, when he says, he who receives, he who receives you receives me. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. He said, he who receives you receives me and receives the one who sent me. Anyone who receives a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. Anyone who receives a righteous man, because he is a righteous man, will receive a righteous man's reward. And then Jesus says this, and if anyone even gives a cup of cold water to the little ones, because he is my disciple, I tell you the truth, will certainly not lose his reward. So accepting someone's agent or representative is the same as accepting the person who sent them. And so when Jesus says, whatsoever you do to the least of my brothers that you do unto me, part of that means when you receive my disciples, you're receiving me. Now the people referred to as sheep had no idea that they were helping God's messengers. They had no idea, did they? When did we see you? When, when did we help you? They had no idea. And sometimes they helped those people at great peril to themselves. But they had no idea that by receiving the messengers of God, they were receiving Jesus himself. They were kind to them, not expecting anything in return, which says something about their nature inside. Now let's contrast to what Jesus says about the goats. They were told that they were not kind to the least of my brothers. They refused to help them, likely because they saw no benefit in helping them. They did not know they were rejecting God's messengers. And they, and they certainly did not know that when they were rejecting God's messengers, they were rejecting the king himself. Had they known that they were rejecting God's messengers, they might have done something different because they would have seen gain in it. We've got to help him because he's friends with the king. So there's an element here of, again, are you receptive to Christ or are you not receptive? Now, if this passage wasn't located at the end of a long series of passages about heaven and judgment and separation and the fact that Jesus is, um, is um, talking about his return, okay, um, we would not catch this. Those who receive God's messenger in the gospel thus accept Jesus as Messiah. And when they accept Jesus as Messiah, they will receive their eternal reward as guaranteed to them by God at the beginning of time. It's prepared for them. Those who do not receive God's messengers in the gospel and thus reject the Messiah will get what they have chosen, which is not a place created by God, but created by the enemy of God for his followers. In other words, over the centuries, people have looked at the humanitarian aspects of this passage, which is very, very, very important. Christians are called to show kindness and hospitality and grace to everyone they meet. However, we must be careful not to discard the context in which this is placed, and that is that we are not saved by our deeds. We have to remember that. We are not saved by our deeds. Heaven is not a reward for being kind. And this can be, if you mistake the beginning of this passage, which is about eternal inheritance and accepting Christ and not accepting Christ, one could be led to believe that it's just about being nice to people. The people that were being given their inheritance were being given because it's because they were adopted as sons and daughters of the King because of their faith in Jesus Christ. We must be careful not to think that everyone gets to go to heaven just because they're nice or they're kind, okay? 
We must be careful not to think that people are saved by works or deeds and don't have to accept the message that Jesus Christ is Lord. We have to understand that those who are the sheep are given an inheritance that was secured by Christ for them and that their faith in Christ is what allows them to be adopted as sons and daughters of the King because their sin is paid for. Now, Christ contrasts the actions of the people he calls sheep towards the brethren and the actions of the goat people to distinguish the future of those who accept Christ and those who do not accept Christ. That is the separation that happens. Those who have accepted Christ and those who have not accepted Christ. It's not those who are nice people versus those who are not nice people. So we have to be very careful how we interpret this passage because it is connected to having faith in Christ and receiving the messenger of Christ and the message of Christ. But what about the humanitarian aspect of this passage? What about it? Well, acts of kindness like feeding the hungry and inviting the stranger and clothing the naked and looking after the sick and visiting prisoners and helping people without regard of who you're helping. In other words, they didn't know they were helping the messengers of the king. So when we, we when we look to help folks simply because we feel called to help folks, that can be evidence of great faith. That is evidence of faith. There are many scriptures that emphasize taking care of the poor. We must not say, well, this means I don't have to take care of the poor or not be kind, but because really there are many scriptures that emphasize caring for the poor, feeding orphans and widows, caring for the sick, and those who are hurting, and the Lord expects his followers, expects his followers to help the poor. Faith should be followed by good deeds. James said it in chapter 2, verse 14 to 17. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes or food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep well formed and well keep warm and well fed, but then does nothing about his physical needs. What good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by actions, is dead. So there is a humanitarian aspect to today's message, but it's not the full context of today's message. The Bible does, though, call us to care for the poor and for those in need. 1 John 3, 17 says, But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brothers in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Proverbs 19, 17 says, Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for the deed. John the Baptist says in Luke 3.17, whoever has two tunics to share is to share with him who has none. And whoever has food is to do likewise. So Christians are called to love others and to demonstrate that love with generosity and acts of kindness. They're called to see every human being as a precious gift from God, worthy of dignity and respect simply because they are loved by God and made in his image. There is a humanitarian truth to this passage in that how we treat the least in society, who what society would call the least, how we treat them is a reflection of how much we love them, and how much we love them is a reflection of how much we love God. And if we can't do that, then we're falling short. Jesus challenges us, challenges us to rethink who is our neighbor, does he not? Who is our brother? For we are all people in need of grace and hope and love. And for those of us who've discovered the love and forgiveness found in Christ, why would we not want to share that? Hopefully it's changed us from the inside out so that these acts of love and these kindness and this charity flows out of us, right? It flows out of us. Certainly those who received Jesus as messengers, the acts of kindness flowed out of them because they had no idea they were serving the king's messengers. 
helping everyone we meet or being kind to everyone should flow out of us, sometimes out of our own obedience if we're honest with ourselves. Okay, I'm going to be nice because God calls me to, even though I don't feel nice today. But hopefully more times than not of a genuine overflowing that is coming from, from within. Now our great founder, William Booth, we know he had a compassion for those in need. He was ahead of his time in sensing these social justice issues that some of us are just coming to grips with now. Uh, he organized a Salvation Army that was motivated to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, yes, but also to meet human needs in his name without discrimination. And without discrimination also means without regard of what they can do for you in return. We tend to think of discrimination in other ways, right, without regarding race and gender and other things. But discrimination is also, are you willing to help someone else? regardless of their status in life. It was William Booth who famously said, and we could probably all, we're not going to ask you to do this, but we probably can all mostly, many of us recite this together, right? While women, while women weep as they do now, I'll fight. While little children go hungry as they do now, I'll okay. fight. While men go to prison in and out, in and out as they do now, I'll okay. fight. That's right. While there is a drunkard left, and while there is a poor lost girl upon the streets, while there remains one dark soul without the light of God, I'll okay. fight, I'll fight to the very end. Amen. You've heard it said, God is not a respecter of persons. Therefore, we're called to love and serve those in need, regardless of their standing in society. When we're able to do that, then we're on the right track spiritually. If we cannot love like that, without an ex expectation of recognition, without an expectation of something back, then we need to get on our knees, right, and ask God to do a work in us. If we see people as more or less valuable based on what they can do for us, we need to get on our knees and say, Lord, you need to do a work in me. When we treat people who can do something for us better than we can treat others who are not in a position to do anything for us, we need to get in our knees and ask God to do a work in us. But taken in its entirety, we must remember the scripture is not about good works alone. Truly good works flow out of a faith-filled, sanctified heart that has been changed by the Holy Spirit. This scripture is not merely a call for believers to do good works. It is also a lesson in eschatology that declares that Jesus Christ is king, and someday he will come back and claim his kingdom. And those on the right will receive an inheritance that can never perish. This scripture challenges us to look within ourselves to examine how receptive we've been to the message of Jesus Christ and to his messengers. But it also challenges us to look within ourselves and consider how have we treated the least, the poorest, the lost in society. The scripture causes us to ask ourselves and to ask him, Lord, when did we see you? Pray that all of us can have faith and trust in Jesus Christ. That is the first lesson in the scripture. And that we can then be the bringers of good news and hope and kindness and charity and love to the whole world. And that's how others will see Christ in us and then hopefully accept him for themselves. As we gather together this Thanksgiving and we remember our families and those who can't be with us, let us also remember those who are not yet brothers and sisters in Christ, who yet do not have an inheritance guaranteed, but they can have it. Let us be agents of that love.
to the least in society. Let us not be a respecter of persons. Let us not look at others and judge them based on what we think their worth is, because everyone has an immeasurable value to God. He loves them eternally. He loves them with an everlasting love. And he calls us to do the same. So let us prepare our hearts and remember that whatever we do to the least, that we do unto him. Let us pray. Lord, as we come to you, help us to remember to receive you and to receive your messengers well and to show you and your messengers hospitality. Let us also remember, Lord, that whatever we do to the least of our brothers that we do unto you. Help us, Lord, to look around and to those who are in need, to those who are struggling. Let us welcome all into our hearts, Lord. Pray for all and show love and kindness to all that you place in our path. And Lord, we thank you and we praise you that you love me when the world would judge me unworthy. Help me to love others, Lord, regardless of their situation regardless of their status. Lord, help us to love all and help provide for them. For whatever we do to the least of our brothers, that we do unto you. Thank you for loving us all. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Karen, I pray that you all have a very happy and blessed Thanksgiving. And that uh, even though this Thursday will be different than most other Thursdays, that you're still able to have a gathering of family and friends, even if some of it is virtually, that you can enjoy a wonderful meal and remember the blessings that God has given us. God bless you all. Have happy Thanksgiving.
given to most of us by all that's on the altar. And every time I come across that song, I always think of commissioning. You know, that time, special time of the year. They call that the springtime for the Salvation Army uh, as the new cadets are in the week commission. Uh, it's a blessing. Uh, but it's also a reminder to us also that we are to consecrate ourselves so I, I will invite you to stand if you'd like to stand. Um, we're going to sing uh, verses 1 and 2. We're going to read the third verse, and then we'll sing on the fourth. And the band will give us an introduction and lead us on. <laughs>
please remain standing for the commission and the benediction. Go now and embrace the hope to which God has called us. Recognize Christ in friend and stranger, and as Christ has been gracious to you, so be gracious to those in need. And will you join me on the benediction? And may God give you a place of rest on rich pasture. May Christ Jesus be the shepherd king who binds your wounds. And may the Holy Spirit give you wisdom and reveal to you the fullness of the one who fills all in all. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Thank you.